Like it's easy to say, because I, I don't have any other reference for it, that we're living in the weirdest time. But I don't know if that's true, right? Like I don't know if political discourse is as bad today or is worse today than it was in the past. Um, I think it's different, right? But but you know, subjectively, is it worse? I, I'm curious. I, I want to believe it's not. Have you ever had George Friedman on the podcast? No. He's actually from Austin. I don't know him, but I'd like to meet him at some point. He's an author, and he wrote this book called The Storm Before the Calm. Mm. Super interesting book. And he lives out here? Yeah, he lives out here. I actually mm. have reached out to Lawrence Wright, who also lives here, to see if he can introduce yeah. me to him. Um, but but it's a it's a fascinating book. He's he's Hungarian, I believe, um, but but you know has lived in the U.S. for many years. And this book, what is the, the name of the book again? The, the Storm, Storm Before, the, Before calm? the Calm. And um, I read it like about six months ago and was beyond blown away. And he writes about these macro cycles that lead to enormous transition mm. in U.S. history. Because uh, again, we're such a young country, right? Two hundred and fifty years old, or barely that, right? And Basically, there were two cycles, and I believe one cycle, so there's like a political cycle and a social cycle, and one of them occurs roughly every 50 years, one of them occurs roughly every 80 years, and he goes through each cycle. So what's the, what creates the, the tension, the pressure, the break point, the rebuild? But what he writes about in this book is, look, this is the first time we're coming up to both cycles happening around the same time, like roughly 2030. Oh. And so what he's, he's saying, like everything that we're going through right now, politically and socially and economically, is... Actually, pretty predictable. And here's what's interesting. He wrote the book, I believe, pre-2020. Whoa. So a lot of what he said was kind of going to happen is already happening. It's super interesting. And the oh. implications for 2024, 2028 in terms of, you know, kind of presidential stuff is is interesting because obviously a lot of it has to do with different administrations and things like that. So what is he predicting is happening? So he thinks we're coming to the end of a cycle where basically the current political and social structure has exceeded its utility, right? So politics as we I don't think anybody would disagree that politics has basically lost its service, right? Like the, the people aren't benefiting from their politicians anymore. So why is that? Well, so, so let's go back to the last cycle. So he said the last cycle was Jimmy Carter into Ronald Reagan, right? And so Re uh, Carter was the last of that cycle, which was kind of super big government. And then Reagan ushered in, you know, obviously small government, uh, but also lots of military spending. And, you know, what he says is, Actually, I'm trying to think. I don't think he actually predicts exactly what's going to happen in the next cycle. But what he says is um, all of the kind of discourse that we're seeing now where basically there's nothing that's really bipartisan anymore. Um, that's going to lead to kind of a breakdown of the system where um, I'm trying to think how he describes it much more eloquently than I can. The gist of it is the... He says that the next president to be elected will be kind of the last of the cycle. So that whoever's elected in 2024, he thinks is kind of the last of the current system we have. And we will, again, it's hard for me to imagine this is true, but what he's basically saying is it will no longer be kind of the elite class running the country. Because, you know, that's obviously what we do right now, right? We have mm. a pretty elite class that runs yeah. the country. Um, how is that possible? I, again, I can't because fathom how it's possible. How, but how, how would it be possible that, that they would relinquish their grasp on power and control? Because it seems like everything they're doing is indicating that they're moving towards greater and greater control and, and more and more. They're taking advantage more and more of the situation to reap financial benefits. You know, when you look at um, just the fucking insider trading that they're allowed to do and no one's stopping – just that. It's, it's just unbelievable yeah. that there's not more pushback against that. Like there's jokes about, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi and what a great stock trader she is. <laughs> but if you just look at the entire list of Republicans and Democrats that are involved in stock trading that do way better than some of the ve very best traders in the world, like it's really clear that this is a fucking money grab and that it's dirty and it's and no, no yeah. one's stopping it and no one's voting to stop there's no one who's speaking out and the problem is the people that would be involved in putting forth legislation to make this illegal are benefiting from it being legal like they would never do that and their constituents aren't fired up about it it seems to be I mean I guess that that's part of the issue right I think that's part of the, the question is like uh, how much longer does that continue yeah where the where the voting class sort of says like uh, yeah enough's enough like we're gonna put people in who are gonna 
kind of change things. It, it's also, you know, we're, we're in a very weird place right now with the, with the media because the media has lost its hold over the narrative. That used to be that the media was the primary place that people would go to find out what's going on in the world. But now the media conveniently leaves out anything that it doesn't want to be at the front and center in, in terms of like things that people concentrate on and talk about. Like one of the greatest examples that's happening right now is this massive protest in France. Massive protest in France, nine million people on the street, literally up This is about arms. the social security change? Yes. Yeah. M Macron in France yeah. takes his fucking $80,000 watch off under the table while he's talking to people about tightening up and about how, you know, about how, you know, th this has to be done. Like it's, he, the guy's wearing a fucking, uh, find out what watch he was wearing. Cause you're a watch head, <laughs> you would like this. But the fact that this dork thought it was a good move to take his fucking watch off under the table. And then there's the, the protests in Israel, enormous protests in Israel, F millions of people on the streets yeah. and you're not hearing a fucking peep about it. You know, all it is is like January 6th, January 6th. Did you see what they did? January 6th, Trump is coming back, but January 6th looms large. How about the fact that the guy who's the president right now can't form a fucking sentence? He makes up words and stumbles through things. And no one says a goddamn thing about it. What watch was he wearing? I'm looking. Uh, France, France said that this is... The, the cost of the watch is fake news. <laughs> so I'm trying to dig through. Oh, do you buy, you buy it used? <laughs> well, so then it's, it's not 80000 yeah, If you're buying it used, yeah. it's going to cost more. Sometimes, right? Oh, Depends on the watch, right? Yeah, most of the time now. Yeah. Isn't that weird? People like uh, used watches. 